Old school. So we are in Esther. Let me get to Esther. Let's all get, you know, well, I, you know, turn in your phones or your Bibles with me to Esther chapter 5 and 6 is what I have been assigned to preach to you today and to talk about. Uh, the beginning of Esther, we had, of course, uh, The Bachelor, right? Xerxes, he's, you know, looking for a new wife, and so he gives the final rose to Esther, right? Because, you know, when... Do y'all know The Bachelor of the show? I have. I. I, I don't watch it. I. I actually had to look it up because I couldn't remember if the, if he gave the rose to the ones that had to leave or if he gave the rose to the ones that stayed. But uh, anyway, the the bachelor he he has all these you know potential brides that he uh, you know has to narrow down who he's going to marry. It's a Really awful gimmick, and uh, I've, like I said, I've never watched the show. I've, I've just been a little bit horrified at it uh, since it, it began. But, you know, that's essentially what Xerxes was doing. He gave the final rose to Esther, and she is the new queen. And then comes the Game of Thrones part of Esther, where you have... Uh, Haman and Mordecai, you know, facing off against each other and all the political intrigue. And then uh, comes Mordecai and Esther, and I couldn't think of a TV show that fit Mordecai and Esther. But today's sermon is Martha Stewart, because Esther throws a lot of parties. You know, this is not Martha Stewart, uh, the stock trading incident and the prison conviction, uh, but rather the party Martha Stewart. Esther is throwing parties. Or maybe it's more like Ina Garten. Anybody know Ina Garten? She's a chef. She, uh, the barefoot contessa is what she goes by. Before she entertains celebrity friends in her house at the Hamptons, uh, she actually worked in the State Department for the Ford and Carter administrations. So, you know, but now she's, you know, all about, you know, entertaining her, her famous friends. If you can't get butter infused with the tears of virgin Dutch milkmaids, store-bought is fine. <laughs> all of this to say Esther is throwing parties with a personal and political purpose. Do you like my alliteration? I, I worked on that really hard. So let's read chapter 5, 1 through 8. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, in front of the king's quarters. While the king was sitting on his royal throne, inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight, and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter, and the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you even to the half of my kingdom. And Esther said, If it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. And then the king said, Bring Haman quickly so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, uh, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? Oh, uh, yeah. What is your wish? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, my wish and my request is that if I have found favor in the sight of the king and if, and if I have pleased the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. So, all right, let's unpack this. 
Uh, she puts on her royal robes for the king. Uh, this can also be, you know, as, as I gleaned from, you know, one uh, interpreter, it, she put on royalty, okay? It can also be read that she put on royalty. Not only was she dressed like a queen, but she, you know, in doing this thing for her people, she was also moving with the confident air of the queen. All right, she was being the queen. And she was approaching uh, the king. And approaching the king in this manner was kind of dangerous, you know? Uh, I mean, in the first chapter, I mean, he totally threw out his first wife, or, you know, his previous wife, Vashti, for saying no. All right, so. The king, you know, could kind of do what he wanted, and to approach him was something that, you know, took a lot of courage. But Esther could definitely read a room, and she could read the king. She knows he's attracted to her. She prepares herself. He sees her. He's smitten with her once more, and he extends his scepter, granting Esther the permission to come to him and have an audience with him. Uh, and then Xerxes makes, uh, you, know, I, uh, you know, I'm not going to try to pronounce that, Anahuarsis, you know, the, the, the name that modern translations give. I'm just going to say Xerxes, if that's okay with you. He makes an extravagant offer to her, right? He, Even if it's half of my kingdom, what can I grant you? Now, both of them knew that it was hyperbolic, Right? It was an exaggeration. He wasn't really going to give her half the kingdom, and she wasn't going to request half the kingdom. Where else in Scripture have we seen kings, you know, doing this, you know, kind of elaborate gesture to those that they are trying to favor? Anything come to mind? Just Herod. Yeah, Herod. And in what context? Yeah, his stepdaughter, he has her come and dance and says, hey, you know, I'll, I'll give you anything that you want if you'll come and do this lewd little dance for me. And uh, he wasn't really quite prepared for her to say, you know, the head of John the Baptist, right? Because, like I said, you know, when kings made this offer, you know, it was understood that you, you would not ask for half the kingdom. Uh, and Esther, you know, didn't ask for half, half the kingdom. She's certainly not going to ask for that. But she is working up to a pretty bold request because it, you know, counteracts, you know, the king's previous order for Haman, right? So she throws a party for the king and Haman. All right. Her request is that the king and Haman come to this party that she has prepared, or a banquet, as uh, you know some uh, translations say. Now, some see this as a momentary uh, lack of courage. Well, uh, you know, kind of a lapse, and you know, she's she's was really going to ask you know, that they not kill the Jews <laughs> uh, or that something be done. But she falters and she says, oh, come to this party I've prepared for you. You know, buying a little bit of time to find the right words. Doesn't say that, but some people see it as that. Now, some people, some interpreters, think that it's a crafty move to gain even more favor with the Xerxes. You know, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, you know, feed him well and uh, all of that. And by including Haman in the mix, if this was her, you know, if this is the right interpretation, she sets up a scenario where her goodwill and hospitality stand in a stark contrast to his wicked treachery. Maybe there was a bit of both at work here. 
It, it happens twice, actually. She invites him to the feast, and then at the feast, he asks her again, you know, what can I give you? And she's like, come to another feast. Um, that kind of draws attention to itself. Perhaps she is giving Haman a chance and an excuse to change his anti-Semitic ways. You know, hey, you know, I invited you to a party. Don't kill my people. Uh, I don't know. We don't really have an answer. However you interpret, though, this is, you know, a very storytelling story. I mean, it's scripture still, but even sometimes scripture, you know, the, the storyteller wants to build suspense, and that, that kind of happens here with Esther drawing this out. This is the story of Purim, right? Purim, anybody know what Purim is? Purim is one of the two, uh, there, there are two really important festivals uh, in Judaism. There are a lot of feasts, don't get them confused with the feasts, but there are two festivals. Uh, Purim is the one that made it into the Protestant scripture via Esther. Uh, Hanukkah uh, didn't quite make it into the Protestant Bible. Uh, the Catholics have the books of the Maccabees. Uh, and some Protestant Bibles have, you know, the Apocrypha attached to them. Uh, but Purim and Hanukkah are both big festivals in Judaism. And this is the story of Purim. And so, you know, making that dramatic is, you know, is something that I think the storyteller is, is trying to do with unveiling his story. It doesn't make it any less true. It just means that he wants you to be riveted. It's an origin story. It's told by the author with a lot of dramatic elements and techniques. And Esther's party planning involving her with a known enemy. And these two invitations of the banquet, like I said, builds up that dramatic tension, right? And it works some magic. Verse 9a. And Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. All right? Haman's pride of place and position are something that we have seen, and we're going to see it again very soon here. Uh, but being served and honored by the queen alongside, you know, the highest royal majesty of the land, you know, feeds his inflated ego. You know, like I said, maybe, you know, she was giving him a chance to, you know, rethink you know, his feeling against the Jews. But, but when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, and he sent and brought his friends and his wife Zeresh. And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions with which the king had honored him and how he had advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king. Then Haman said, even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast. She prepared, and tomorrow also I am invited by her together with the king. Yet all this is worth nothing to me so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. And then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows, fifty cubits high, be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. So Haman sees Mordecai. You know, he, he's coming out of his feast with the king, uh, at the hospitality of Queen Esther. He's really happy. His ego is, is really satisfied, but he sees Mordecai and losing, loses it, right? Not totally, though. It says that he restrained himself, <laughs> which implies that he was so furious that he might have said or done something even more destructive right then and there. But instead... He gathers his wife and his friends together so that he can gloat and tell them about himself, which is typical narcissism. Uh, Haman is a narcissist. 
And narcissists need an audience, or even better, an entourage. And a good entourage knows how to listen and fawn and reinforce the narcissist's point of view. And his wife will go even a step further in just a second. It says his wife and his friends, but his wife kind of seems to lead the way. But before we get to that, narcissists also, you know, another tra uh, trait of narcissists is that they cannot abide intrusion into or contradiction of their self-centered worldview, all right? Uh, y we've had some narcissists, you know, in power before. I think many of us can think of personal narcissists in our lives. You know, these people, they need somebody to talk about themselves to. And they can't stand anything that takes away from themselves or contradicts themselves. And so Mordecai was the proverbial fly in Haman's ointment. Just building on another biblical reference there. Mordecai would not play the part of the fawning entourage to Haman. Mordecai did not vindicate Haman's sense of self-worth. Mordecai, in the act of not bowing, contradicted Haman's viewpoint. So, you know, Haman wanted to eradicate this thing that you know, he saw Mordecai as a thing that, you know, contradicted him. So Zeresh, Haman's wife, she pulls a Lady Macbeth. And I know I'm, a, I'm, I'm an actor and a theater person, and we're not supposed to say Macbeth, but I'm not on stage, so it's okay. And really, seriously, some actors, you know, take that very seriously, and they make you go and turn around uh, outside three times and apologize to, you know, the theater gods. And, uh, uh, yeah, you know, Macbeth is, is not something you want to say around actors, but I can say it here. Lady Macbeth told, you know, she, she goaded her husband, right, to kill the king and take the kingship. And so Zeresh, she, she gets a little bloodthirsty here. And she suggests that Haman get rid of Mordecai by asking the king to hang him. She even suggests that he construct the gallows right now. Do, do it before you even go to the king. That way it's there and ready, and you can ask the king and he can grant the, you know, so she gets him to build the gallows, and, you know, I mentioned the storytelling aspect of the book, right? Spoilers, this gallows that Haman builds is going to come back, ironically, against him, right? Anton Chekhov, anybody know the playwright Anton Chekhov? He was a playwright, he was an author. Uh, in Russia at the end of the 1900s, not 1900s, uh, the 1800s, the 19th century, uh, he had a statement that if in the first act of a play you have a gun, it has to go off in the second act of the play. Before Chekhov's gun was Haman's gallows. He builds the gallows here for Mordecai, but Mordecai isn't the one that hangs from them. But I digress, and I get ahead of myself. And, you know, I spoiled the book for you. I'm sorry, you know. Let's look at, at chapter 6. On that night, the king could not sleep. And he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the Chronicles. And they were read before the king, and it was found written how Mordecai had told about Big Thana, and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahusuerzexes. And the king said, What honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's young men who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. So, Xerxes, unable to sleep, he does a little light reading. All right? This leads him to discover that he has failed to reward someone for an honorable deed done on his behalf. And here's just a thought. It seemed a little coincidental, right, that the king would read about Mordecai at this point. 
But here's the thought. Consider. He has just been a, a party to his queen's kindness and hospitality, right? Oh, you want me to speak louder? Okay, I'll try. I'll try. Paul is telling me to speak louder. All right. He has just been party to his queen's kindness and hospitality. Uh, perhaps his perusable, perusal of perusable, perusal of memorable deeds <clears throat> was inspired by a positive reaction to Esther's banquets. I mean, you know, he's received something very nice, and he's like, you know, a lot of other people have been doing nice things for me. Uh, hey, they're even recorded in this book. Why don't I look at this book of memorable deeds and, and see some of the other things that people have done for me? And maybe when he stumbles across Mordecai saving the king himself, he wants to do something kind and generous himself. Just a thought. So he's eager to do something about the fact that nothing has been done to reward Mordecai for saving the king. So, in verse 4 of chapter 6, And the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's young men told him, Well, Haman is there standing at, in the court. And the king said, Well, let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, what should be done to the man who the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, Well, who would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. Uh, and let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor and let them lead him on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Okay. So Xerxes wants to honor this hitherto unsung faithful servant. So he reaches out for help you know, from whoever is nearby, all right? You know, hanging around the court are all of the court officials and nobles and people who want to be the entourage to the king. Uh, enter Haman. Uh, uh, is it a coincidence? Well, not really, because Haman is really eager to get or Mordecai hanging from his gallows, right? So, here comes Haman, and he has something on his mind. But, guess what? What's on the king's mind is more important than what is on Haman's mind. And so Xerxes you know, says, oh, before you, you tell me your thing, Haman, let me tell you my thing. And he says he wants to honor someone who has done a life-saving act for the king. Haman thinks, of course, that Xerxes is talking about himself. Uh, typical narcissism. So he describes a scenario that he would love you know, to have, involving a, a, a great public display, royal robes, a horse and a crown, pageantry with the subject dressed in the robes and led through the city on the crowned horse by a high-ranking official, all right? In Haman's mind, it's, it's him on the horse, but it turns out that the person on the horse is not Haman, but the one that Haman wants to hang, in verses 10 and 11, the king said to Haman, well then, okay, hey, this is pretty cool. You know, what you've, you've said is, is, is great. Hurry, take the robes and the horses you've said, and do so to Mordecai, the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. It turns out that uh, Xerxes is not as anti-Semitic as, as uh, Haman is. Take it to Mordecai, the Jew, and uh, who sits at the king's gates, leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. 
So Mordecai has to go and dress, or not Mordecai, Haman has to go and dress, you know, his enemy uh, in the robes and put him on the horse and lead him through the city and proclaim uh, how great he is and how much the king wants to honor him. So lots of irony here. And it doesn't end there, but, you know, that's coming next week. Remember the gallows. <clears throat> Let's finish up this chapter here. Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house mourning and with his head covered, and Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, Well, if Mordecai before, him, you, before whom you have begun to fall is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before them before him. And while they were talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared, which leads us into next week's sermon. But Haman, humiliated, returns to his entourage, his wife and his friends. And even though they're a good entourage, they're really good at fawning and adoring and listening to Haman talk about himself. Uh, they excel at that. They still have to acknowledge the truth, okay? Mexico didn't pay for the wall. Maybe you didn't get to keep your health care. There's many times where we have to, you know, people have to face, you know, the truth about what they've uh, stated to be fact. All right. You're going to fall before this Jew, Mordecai, because he's Jewish, you know. Implied in Zeresh's statement is something that you see throughout Scripture, throughout history. You go against God's chosen people, the Jews, and it will ultimately end in failure. Yes, they faced capture, enslavement. Yes, they went into exile. Yes, they were dispersed into the nations. Yes, they were put in ghettos and faced pogroms, rounded up and murdered in a horrific holocaust. And yes, they are continuing to this day to be assaulted by people who claim to be woke. But these woke people will have to face that God is still in charge. Yahweh may not be on anybody's minds, just as it's not in the book of Esther, but Yahweh is still in control. The Jewish people will persevere, and they will persevere not because of who they are, but who God is and who God sees them as. Zeresh knows this. Haman should have known. <clears throat> And, you know, Zeresh doesn't mention, like I said, Yahweh. She might not even know Yahweh's name. But, even though he doesn't appear in Esther, his hand is on all of this. His unseen hand is demonstrated to both the Jews and their oppressors. It's not just the Jews that see the miracle, but Haman himself before he hangs, is going to see that miracle. Yahweh will always save his people. So, what are we to draw from this? Well, one thing, don't be a narcissist. You know, that's, that's a given. It can come and bite you in the ego, all right? But do be kind and hospitable even to your enemies. I mean, Jesus even takes it a step further. Love your enemies. Not only does it, you know, put burning coals on their head, but it also means that you don't have to suffer because of, you know, I mean, maybe you have to suffer, but you don't have to suffer internally. You don't have to punish yourself with hatred of them uh, because of what they've done to you. You give up some of that pain uh, if you love your enemies. Also, you know, eschatologically, 
you know, in terms of the end times, which, you know, I mean, I, I don't know when they're going to happen. You know, I thought that happened before I got this old. Uh, maybe they'll happen in my lifetime, maybe they won't. But I do believe that they're coming, and I do believe that they involve God's people, the Jews. And so keep that in mind. Pray for Israel. Pray for God's people. And uh, pray that, you know, they will be ready to acknowledge Jesus when he comes again. Also, however insignificant you may feel, God has placed you where you are, when you are, and even if you find yourself in a hostile environment or culture, and I think we can say that the culture and environment are becoming more and more hostile these days, we have been placed where we are and when we are by God. And we can make a difference by accessing God's love, by being kind, by being hospitable, and by being true to him. Esther may have been unable to change the heart uh, of Haman, the anti-Semite, but she caught the attention of the king who can help God's people. And guess what? Even though Yahweh isn't mentioned here, she caught the attention of Yahweh. And she's in the Bible. And she's one of two women who have books named for them in the Bible. In a, a world that was dominated by men, that's pretty significant. Anyway, let's pray. Father God, help us to know what you want us to, to do. Uh, help us to, to see that you've placed us here and now, and that you want us to love and to extend your love and to be your love to those around us. Uh, help us to, to love Israel, to love our enemies, uh, and to support each other as a community in these trying times. In Jesus' name, amen.